Welcome back to part two of Cultural Caravan TV's special three-part series on international affairs, featuring two phenomenal women of diplomacy, former U.S. ambassador to Senegal and former director of University of Central Florida's diplomacy program and author of Diversifying Diplomacy, My Journey from Roxbury to Dakar, Ambassador Harriet Lee Elam Thomas, as well as policy expert, Ambassador Pamela L. Spratlin, whose experience includes 10 years in Central Asia, an area that we're all talking about right now, including serving as US Ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, Ambassador to Uzbekistan, and Country Director Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Asia, from 2006 to 2007. Her experience also includes four years in Russia, including as Council General in Vladivostok from 2002 to 2004. Ladies, welcome back to Cultural Caravan TV. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Yes, you know, it, it was interesting. Um, those of you in the audience who missed episode one, then you missed a lot. I highly recommend that you go back to find out more about the journey and achievements of these uh, career U.S. diplomats, as well as how um, they, they see diversity um, and how far we've come in terms of that, in terms of the U.S. Department of State and Foreign Service and how much further we have to go. But one of the things uh, before we get into, again, what uh, a lot of people are talking about, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, um, I think perhaps we need to get a little background on this big former superpower that we're dealing with, that we're talking about Russia. Um, I remember when we first spoke, Ambassador Spratlin, you talked about what drew you to Russia, considering a lot of people don't see uh, African Americans as uh, being uh, that interested or um, even uh, uh, in place, so to speak, in that region. But you, you definitely had your reasons, but perhaps you can shed some light on maybe some things we should know or some misconceptions that we might have about Russian culture. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me this evening. It's a real pleasure to be on Cultural Caravan for this second episode. And I'm delighted to be here with a colleague and, and good friend, Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas. With respect to the issue of just this issue of Russia, um, I, I want to just take us back a little bit. Um, Russia is a fascinating country. And the I think one of the things that's important for your audience to know is that it has been a place of discovery and adventure for Black people actually for a very long time going all the way back to the 18th century uh, during the reign of Peter the Great, who was the, the great modernizer in, uh, in Russian history, um, who started his reign in 1721, he, he, there was a, an African military um, uh, individual who worked with him, Ganibal. And Ganibal is the, the great grandfather of Russia's great um, artist, uh, writer, uh, opera creator, Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. And uh, Pushkin was a very much a figure of uh, the late um, 18th and uh, early 19th uh, centuries, and born in 1799 and then died in 1837. So there's been, I guess the point I wanna make is black people have been uh, associated with Russia in very small numbers, but for quite a long time. And so um, when we start to understand this amazing, huge country by, by its area, the largest country on earth, um, I think one of the mis misconceptions is that black people have never been there and um, have never fared well there. And I would say that while our numbers have been very, very small, um, we have been present in every period of Russian history. 
in the imperial period that lasted from 1721 until 1917, in the Soviet period that lasted from 1922 until the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, and in the post-Soviet period as well. Each one of those was distinct and different, but we have been present on that space um, in small numbers from the very beginning. Um, I would say that in terms of uh, the people, uh, one of the misconceptions is that Russians are as cold as the landscape. And I would say that it's a country of 145 million people, uh, which means that it has people of all different types, as you would find anywhere. It also isn't only Slavic people. Um, I've had the pleasure of traveling to a place like Yakutia in the middle of the country, where the people look very much like they could be from Alaska. Um, I have found that there are people from Ukraine in every part of the Russian Federation. This is partly due to Soviet policies, but it is a country that is quite diverse. It is a country that has a very large Muslim population, which is something that may be of, surprise, of, of some surprise to people. It is also a country that even though its economy is only the size, about the size of Texas, it's important because it, it has many natural resources and so people need to understand that what's happening right now in the world is going to touch us because Russia's oil and gas are very, very important commodities for the world. And of course, Russia is an important uh, geostrategic player uh, in the world. Um, I think they believe that they are still a superpower, although they're trying to, to work many, many things out now. Um, but I also think there's, there's a misconception about Russian uh, popular culture. Russia is a country that has very, very deep, uh, uh, a very deep history in, of, of art, uh, all the way from religious paintings of the icons uh, to some amazing artists um, who have come out of uh, the Russian Federation, particularly in the early part of the 19th century. Great novelists, some would argue the greatest novel ever written, um, uh, with Anna Karenina, War and Peace, uh, Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy. So uh, there are, uh, Russia is a big country, it has a big history, and uh, there's, there's much, much to know about it. And it isn't all dreary and sad, although it is almost always cold. And it's, it is funny when you when you mentioned uh, your your experience in Yakuts, I was like, I, isn't that the coldest uh, uh, place yes. in the world that is inhabited by humans? Yes. <laughs> I actually know somebody from there, long, long story. <laughs> but but uh, yes, um, th thank you so much for that because I think that, um, you know, our audience is multi-generational. And so there are some of us who are Cold War babies, so to speak. Uh, yes, I am aging myself a little bit, you know, who remember when there was something uh, called the Soviet Union, but then remember when there was this period of glasnost, right? You know, and, you right. know, so going from this big, you know, enemy, you know, um, that we battled in so many different ways, sometimes indirectly, Cuban Missile Crisis, things of that nature, to now, you know, in more recent times, focusing on other regions that seem to be more of a threat and a concern, particularly areas in the Middle East. So I think some that 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 summary, so to speak, that you gave was very helpful and might be a launching pad for people to to dig a little bit deeper into not only our relations but also the history and culture um, mm -hmm. of, of of Russia and the Russian people. I know um, some of the things that a lot of people don't know is how. Uh, the, the period of time when they were the former uh, the Soviet Union, they actually invited um, African Americans to come to communist Russia. And um, these were, I believe, and, and please do, you know, uh, uh, chime in if I'm, I'm misspeaking, uh, Ambassador uh, Spratlin and Elam Thomas, these were uh, black scientists, these were black engineers, um, and welcomed them. And the, um, my understanding is that some of the appeal and why some of us did go was because of the um, overwhelming experience of racism experienced here. So the promise of, you know, not having to deal with that and being appreciated for your merit. Um, and this was, this was before the civil rights movement, you know, before Martin Luther King's dream um, of being judged by your character. So I guess I, I want to know, like, you know, um, particularly with that period, like, 
what 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 impact do you think that that had or you know to what extent is that something that is still you know the case today you know this 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 place where there might not be the same type of discrimination that you experience um whether it's in terms of the experience of those um black um uh uh uh, professionals that went over or today? Well, certainly the coming of the, the communist authority in Russia was seen as a shocking event um, in, the, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. World War I was over and the civil war in Russia was then soon over. And in 1922, um, the Bolsheviks came to power and the Soviet Union was, was born. Um, Russia at that time was a very poor and agrarian country as it became the, the Soviet Union. And one of the things that its leadership wanted to do was to, to uh, industrialize the country, to modernize the country. And they realized that they didn't have all of the technology to do that. And so one of the things that they did was to approach uh, some uh, US experts and scientists, including people like George Washington Carver, um, to ask whether uh, individuals of African descent could come and support uh, parts of the Soviet Union as they tried to develop. George Washington Carver uh, did not get directly and deeply involved, but some scientists did come over. And to this day, uh, recently on, uh, on one of the social media platforms, the ambassador to Russia even had posted uh, for African-American History Month, the pictures of some of the scientists who came over to help Uzbekistan with its cotton production. And what Uzbekistan, where I served as ambassador, was one of the southernmost uh, uh, socialist republics. And it became a wealthy, a wealthy part of the former Soviet Union because of its cotton production. It was and is still known as kind of the white gold of uh, Uzbekistan, bringing in hard currency for a long period of time. And the strains were weak at the time that they were producing cotton, which they'd started to do in the imperial period of Russia. And it was that scientific support from African-Americans that helped strengthen uh, the strains of, of cotton that were produced. And ultimately Uzbekistan produced some of the best quality cotton in the world. And that was thanks to some um, black scientists and scholars. I'd also like to just note that in the, the artistic arena, uh, one of the things that happened in the Cold War was the tension that you've already spoken about. And uh, the Soviets were aware that of this, this long history of slavery and then discrimination in the Jim Crow period. And they wanted to try to exploit that and take advantage of uh, black grievances about uh, the, the discrimination and the treatment received in the United States. And so they invited some people uh, to come to Soviet uh, Russia. And it, even if it meant um, dealing with communist authority, some people did go. Others just explored. And I would just commend to your audience a wonderful book that was written by Langston Hughes, who came over um, in the 30s. And he uh, had a long trip that started in Moscow went all the way down to Turkmenistan, into Uzbekistan. He went with a theater troupe and his, his telling of this tale. Um, I remember this, this story about drinking tea in Turkmenistan out of a cup with somebody who had a terrible cold, but that's how you shared culture. At the time, you had to share the same cup. And he went along with the program and we all know he lived to tell the tale. So um, again, uh, the, yes, African-Americans did have experiences in the former Soviet Union. A few people stayed, but of course uh, the vast majority came back home. Um, and when they did go, they were trying to escape the discrimination that they, they felt. Later on, and here Ambassador Elam Thomas may know something too, um, what they, uh, the Soviets realized that the medium of jazz was powerful music that was sweeping the world. And some of our jazz musicians through the uh, US uh, agency, US information agency did go to the former Soviet Union and they performed. And I will say that in my time, both in the Russian Federation and in Uzbekistan and the Kyrgyz Republic, I would often have people in the older generation tell me how much they enjoyed those broadcasts of American jazz musicians and how they came to know that American idiom so well. And one of my uh, favorite movies in Russia is a movie called We Are Jazz. And it really, I like it because it shows the idea of leadership 
uh, being communicated through jazz, the music and the creativity that comes with it in a system that really in no way prized uh, any kind of freedom or any of, of expression. So um, it was a really remarkable thing that our artists and were able to go to the former Soviet Union, share this tradition with uh, a, a Soviet audience. Um, and then, you know, of course it was exploited by Soviet authorities because of the discrimination that was taking place in the United States. However, as I said, the vast majority of our musicians and artists did their performances and then came back to the United States, but they left an imprint. Thank you so much for sharing just that balance of impact that we had in terms of technology as well as entertainment. Because I think that we often hear about our culture, African-American culture transmitting through the arts, which is wonderful, you know, and I, you know, we, we shouldn't negate that because that's a beautiful thing. But at the same time, you know, to what extent do people know about the fact that we are actually innovators of technology and industry and like whole nations have been able to produce the resources that they need based on African-American um, intelligence. Um, so thank you so much for, 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 for adding that. You know, it's, it's funny when you told that anecdote about the, um, you know, the person with the coal and the tea, I said, you know, that, that, that sure enough is some, some, some black people being polite. You know, we, we definitely do that. You know, it's like, we were raised right. You know, like, you know, you want to sit there and take a little sip, you know, you know, now, now that we're in this, you know, uh, panorama, so to speak still, maybe that might not be something that they would do, no. you know, <laughs> but um, definitely that makes me think about how, you know, uh, our culture actually is perceived abroad or how we, we, we implement or express our culture abroad. But that actually brings me to a question about your personal experience there. Now, yes, we have the Pushkins and, you know, we have, you know, these black engineers and scientists, some of whom stayed, some of whom, you know, looked around and then took this, this self right, right on back. But um, at the same time, you know, fast forward to the 21st century. So here you are, a black woman in, um, you know, in Russia at this time, you know, so it's post Cold War. Um, not sure how many people know about some of that past history, whether it's in the US or Russia. How were you perceived as a professional um, there by, by colleagues, but also just in terms of your life, you know, going around what, how were you perceived and what impact do you think your identity or presence as a black woman had on, uh, both the colleagues and the, the people that you interacted with personally? Well, it's an excellent question, uh, Rabin, and it kind of depended on where I was. I arrived in Moscow in the summer of 2000. Um, and when we think that the, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, we were still fairly early in the new period. And Russia was coming through an economic trial uh, based on the e e Asian uh, economic crisis that had taken place in 1998. Uh, goods were not terribly available on the store in the stores and people were really trying to get back on their feet uh, when I arrived. So I think their focus was internal and very, very much economic. I was working at the US Embassy in Moscow and I was one of very few African-Americans there. Uh, there may have been a Marine or two, but that was pretty much it. I did have some problems and I was warned. When I first uh, it even entertained the idea of coming to Russia, the man who was number two in the embassy told me, you know, there is prejudice here, there is racism here in Russia and you may be a victim of it, we will do everything we can to make you uh, feel comfortable here, but this is a reality. And I did have an experience um, when I was just walking from one of the metro stations where these people started, these young men, young uh, white Russian men started to taunt me as I was walking back to the embassy. And I probably shouldn't have done this, but I was unhappy with them. I turned around and I just uh, put my hands like that. They ran off. And so the... Um, the people in the security office felt that I shouldn't have confronted them in any way, shape or form, but I did get them to disperse. And I, I let the embassy know that that was not something that I could um, accept. And so after that, I did move on to the embassy camp compound where there was some housing available. And that really made it possible for me to, to stay in Moscow the rest of my tour without feeling uh, terribly unsafe. I think the greatest challenge for somebody who's black there is that 
there just aren't very many uh, black people. And so some people are quite sophisticated and will leave you alone, but others will stare at you. Um, and I would say being a woman, I probably received uh, less trouble than some of the men, but um, the church I attended in Moscow had many students who were studying at the, the successor to Patrice Lumumba University, which had been established in 1960. It was now called People's Friendship University. And they were from all over Africa, and some of their experiences in the metro were absolutely horrific. Um, experiences being taunted, being called names, being beaten up. And yet at the same time, I had the opportunity to attend um, the defense of a dissertation. Uh, there was a, a very a brilliant young scholar from the Ivory Coast who happened to marry a woman from Japan who was there for the same program. And I just thought this is a pairing I'm not sure would happen even in the United States. And when I, his professor fully supported him, again, a Russian man, and he got through and got his PhD, I believe it was in math, um, from uh, the university, and then he went on to his career. So I would say, I just want to show that there's contrast. Um, any place we show up as Black people, we can often have the problems of all kinds of discrimination or, or hatred being expressed toward us. But it doesn't mean that every single person is expressing that. Um, other people, I, when I would take taxis in Moscow, which I did often, I didn't have a car in Moscow, and there's a system then, I don't know if it exists now, where you would just flag down, you just put your hand out and you flag down a car. And anybody, any, any citizen could pick you up and then uh, take you where to your destination. You just pay them cash. And it was a little side hustle for a lot of people, almost a kind of Uber before there was Uber. And um, I would do that all the time. I never had any problems. I got home safely every time. I did hear some amazing things in those rides, um, but uh, but I in the in the end it was not overall an unsafe place for me, Rabin. It was just a place where I had to be careful in a big city, like anybody has to be careful. With respect to how I was received by colleagues, um, especially the the Russian population, it really varied. By the time I got to Vladivostok. I was the consul general, which meant that I was the official American. And there, I think people uh, received me well. I was able to see all of the governors of the, that particular region. When I would ask to have meetings with them, they would, uh, they would receive me very courteously and we would have the tea and have the discussions. And again, it was, I think, my Americanness that made that possible. I was able to take the metro wherever I went, if they had one. If I was in a place that was more rural, I was still um, received well. And as I mentioned to you, I went to Yakutia. And there, the main thing is just don't open your mouth to say hello, because it's just so cold that you, um, even that can feel very dangerous. But I would, the overall impression is that it varied. It depended on what the context was. It depended on where I was. Um, sometimes people would, you know, give me strange looks. In the main, I think people treated me in a very polite way, and some people were extremely friendly. And I uh, did make some wonderful acquaintances uh, with some other diplomats and with some of the Russians who were there. Um, and as I said, I was received as an official American, so with uh, the politeness that you would expect. But of course, some people are going to express their racism, and that happened to me while I was in Russia. Wow, fascinating. I mean, I think so much of your experience, Ambassador Spratlin, uh, reflects the reality that there's uh, both intelligence and ignorance everywhere. Uh, being based in New York City, I definitely have seen uh, a little bit of both. Um, and I guess a lot of it has to do with, you know, the, the, the background of the people that you encounter. You know, some people are very well educated and worldly, um, and others are not, you know. But again, that's not something that deterred you. And for that, we're very, very grateful because I'm sure your presence uh, spoke very well of us uh, abroad. So uh, definitely grateful for that. But, you know, this was a great foundation for the next episode that I hope everyone tunes in for where we actually talk more specifically about the impact of this current conflict between Russia, which we just learned a lot more about today, and the Ukraine. Um, how will it affect us here in the United States? Um, economically, in terms of humanitarianism abroad? And also, what about the state of African people in the Ukraine right now? 
Um, to what extent should we care or should we be involved considering what we've heard? What are the facts? So tune in for that in the next episode, part three of this three-part special edition of Cultural Caravan TV. Cultural Caravan audience, please do go on to social media, check out those associations they said, but also check out Cultural Caravan TV's website, as well as our YouTube channel, like and subscribe, as well as feel free to make a donation to our program. If you like programming like this, that gives you another perspective that uh, introduces you to hidden figures of wonderful Black history, living legends right now, then you need to support us. So please do go to the YouTube channel, like and subscribe. Also our website where you can also contribute as well. Thank you so much again. Please do share this episode and I'll see you next time on the next edition of Cultural Caravan TV. We encourage you to send contributions to P.O. Box 300851, Jamaica, New York, 11430. Thank you.